Welcome everyone to another Voices with Raveki. I'm really happy. Uh, this is my third time uh, with Rich Blundell. And it's great to have you back, uh, Rich. Rich has offered uh, to give uh, a bit of an overview of our last two uh, discussions. Uh, at times, I think we got into genuine dialogos, and then we'll take it from there. There's lots of momentum. There's lots for he and I to still talk about. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, first of all, it's it's great to be here again with you, Rich. So thank you very much for coming on and uh, taking us through this recap. It's good to see you, John. And uh, it's been a while, uh, a lot of developments, a lot of uh, new thinking that's uh, come about since the last time we spoke. So I'm excited to think about that, talk about that some more. Um, but as far as the recap, I, well, here's in preparing for this conversation, I went back and listened to our previous yeah. two conversations and they were really good. I mean, they, I, I think we, you know, we, we dove deep, we explored some, some really sort of novel, ter novel territory, I think. Uh, so I thought just to recap that a little bit, um, we started off with my explaining um, this thing that I call Oika, which is a, it's a practice, but it's more of a, it's really more of a mode of being in the world Oika, right. that's that's grounded in the intelligence of nature, which right. is a relational intelligence. Yes, it's, it's very much uh, a commitment to um, the relational dynamics from which everything that is springs. Yes. Um, so we talked about that a little bit. Then we talked a bit about um, my history, how my sort of engagement with the world, which, which is fairly unique, I think, fairly accidental, um, fairly unconventional, how that way of, how that story, how that trajectory through life has, has, has informed and guided and flavored this thing called Oika. Mm -hmm. And then we talked a little bit about my formal research, which I think is probably the least interesting thing, which was, but my research was about how engaging with the story of the universe as a um, whole totalizing and comprehensive narrative of the evolution of the universe can elicit transformative experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and I, actually, when I say it that way, that's not all that uninteresting, but yeah. my research may have been a little less interesting the way that I, you know, the methodology. Uh, and then I, but then in our second call, we got into some really interesting territory, which was around the um, the religious impulse and the yeah. um, the sort of formal uh, uh, the formal ways in which the religious impulse is expressed and yeah. not expressed. And I think we were starting to approach how you know this thing that I call oika uh, it. it, it can 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 elicit some of those very same right, right. commitments and and right. um and um experiences of the world so that that stuff's really interesting and exciting to me and i think really relevant and it's something that the engagement with formal religion uh and sorting out new territory is really interesting to me really exciting so you know, these these are some of the things I also was hoping perhaps that we could uh, do a little updating on, on what we've been up to. Um, sure. I, you know, I, I follow you whenever you post something, I'm, you know, I'm right on it and I download it and wow, study it. <laughs> um, so if we can weave some of that, it'd be great too. Sure. Uh, well, um, what, what, what uh, as you've been following some of my most recent work, what comes to mind that's relevant to that last point? Because I'd like to still at least start at that point. That's the thing mm. that's drawing me in that, that point about the, what you're calling, and I, I like it, the religious impulse and religious formation and what relationship that might have or might not have uh, to the existing uh, axial legacy world religions. Mm. Uh, and then yeah, I've been exploring that. I've been exploring about you know, in different ways, um, had an excellent conversation with, for example, Claire Carlisle about her amazing book on Spinoza's religion, which is really just point on that topic. And Spinoza is really trying to stand outside. He wants to be in deep dialogue with, but he's trying to stand outside Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and nevertheless come to some understanding 
that is viable within the scientific framework, but also has uh, authentic spiritual depth of, you know, the satisfaction of that religious impulse, because he ultimately thinks um, it is absolutely necessary to the kind of life he calls the blessed life. And uh, that, 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 that's the whole point of Claire's book. And I've been wrestling with that. I've been wrestling with that in, uh, in an attempt to really go back and get Plato's theory of the forms into something that is phenomenologically practicable and not practicable or practical, which I, I think is now a word I can't use anymore because of what it's degenerated into. Uh, but it's something we can, uh, it's, it's an ascesis. It's a, it, it is a, a praxis uh, for us. Um, mm. I might adopt the horrible sounding praxeological as my adjective <laughs> rather than practical, uh, just because practical people hear the wrong thing when they hear practical. Yeah. They yeah. think it means sort of mundane, useful. Um, and that's not what I'm trying to get at. Practicable. Um, yeah, practicable is also good too. Um, and so I, I, those are the two big things I've been wrestling with and try, and, and, and sorry, three. And then the third is a, an ongoing discussion with Jonathan Pajot and Jordan Hall, others about um, hyper agency, hyper objects. Um, mm -hmm. And I think all of these three, three things, to my mind, uh, the reason why I'm pursuing them, it, it, I mean, I think they're all inherently important, but I think they're all internally connected with each other um, in a profound way. Um, and I, I'm trying to get them to come together. I'm trying to see what the logos is that's drawing those three things together. Um, so um, that's sort of a quick recap of where I see I've been up to and, and how it overlaps with this, this point where we had left off, you know, this really mm -hmm. trying to uh, explicate and exact um, this, what does the religious impulse mean for us now? And, and what should it mean for us now? Right. And so uh, you mentioned uh, Spinoza's blessed life. How would you characterize that? Like, or how would he characterize that? Would you say like, what is in a nutshell, what does the blessed life mean? So the blessed life is um, a, a life in which one is, one has fully realized, not just intellectually, it's not for Spinoza, it's not with the canadus, with the very sort of dynamics of one's being with uh, right, that one has fully realized in the intellectual love of God and stanza intuitiva, full participation in God, where, mm. and Spinoza means God or nature. Now you have to be really careful. And Claire mm. and I drew this point out and she really emphasizes it. When Spinoza says God or nature, he doesn't mean God or nature the way we mean he means something that will change both our notions of God and nature. And so you, ha you have to see them like almost like two lenses that you stereoscopically look through to something that is beyond our, our, our current notions of God and our current notions of nature. That's what he's trying to do, very much like uh, Nishitani's sieve. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it's a triangulation or it's not a, a choice or. Um, and so that full participation in that sort of ultimate reality. And for Spinoza, this is simultaneously the height of reason and the deepest kind of love that a human being is capable of. And for Spinoza, those are deeply interdependent. Spinoza repeatedly says he's probably the most logical of all the rationalists, but he says that reason alone cannot bring the blessed life because you need love to break you out ultimately of an egocentric framework. And then only within that breaking beyond an egocentric framework can reason unfold in a way that puts us into right relationship, participatory knowing of God. That's the well, you, are, you also said though that he had was considered a heretic. And oh, very and much. Why? Everybody. Why would that, why would that formulation uh, bring about the, the claim of hereticism so that's a really good point because there's in one sense you know the whole neoplatonic tradition within christianity islam and judaism are about and i think claire makes a good argument for that i have a book called participation in god which i have to read uh, that she made use of um that argues that that is actually you know uh, the core of uh these uh the abrahamic religions and i think you can make an analogous argument for the non-Abrahamic religions, this, this ultimate deep participation. What made so was it, it a, So was it a political or was it something more, more deep? Was it more ideological, the, it, the it, basis? It, 
it was political, ideological, and religious all at the same time, as Spinoza's work was wont to be. Uh, mm. Because what he did, I mean, so he writes the ethics, but he also writes the Tractatus Politicus, mm. right? All mm. that stuff. Um, so, I mean, Spinoza dared to claim that, that the Bible was a flawed human creation. Uh, he, he thought it was an important document through which we could come into an under. He started biblical criticism. He literally started it. Uh, whereas, which is not theology, which is not theology, which is to stand mm -hmm. right to try, mm -hmm. but to stand aside and criticize it as a document, and you know, point out, uh, uh, and then try to. He was trying to separate the religio. I'll use my language. He doesn't use. He uses the one term, by the way. He uses these terms, but he doesn't. And I think he uses them in a way that's consonant uh, with mine. But it's. Anyways, he's trying to he's trying to liberate the religio from the credo. Um, uh, he's really trying to get back to well the intellectual love of God, the scientia intuitiva, the 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 direct participation, and that's the religio, that sense of deep connectedness. Mm -hmm. And he sees the the credo of Judaism because he was excommunicated from his Jewish community, and of Christianity he was declared a heretic. Um, he sees the credo of the existing religions of his time as inadequate and even distorting of the capacity for religio. So he criticizes very deeply all the creedal uh, like, uh, understandings uh, of Judaism, Christianity, uh, and more indirectly, Islam. Uh, and so that, that pisses everybody off in a deep, deep way. Um, I don't quite see why, but I'll take your word for it. And I uh, well, actually, I can. Well, well, why is because all of these, you have to remember what's happening. Um, we, things that we separate weren't separated. So the religious wars are just coming mm. to an end in Europe. And, and being Protestant or Catholic is not just sort of a statement of your spirituality spiritual existential yeah. commitment it's a national political even military right. uh, declaration right and of course christianity as a whole has been standing against islam in a military fashion and then right and then of course there has been the long standing tension the the anti-semitism within christianity towards judaism because uh, the jews rejected jesus so there is there right these doctrinal differences are life and death at that point. So the mm. commitment to the creedal uh, aspects is not, for many people, the creed is transparent. They can't see it because they can only see through it. That is the, to their mind, that is the only way uh, to see, to realize the religious. Mm. The creedal, mm. the creed, whereas in our conversation, or at least in my presupposition, we can separate them analytically and perhaps even phenomenologically and existentially at that historical time. Sure. They, they can't be separated or at okay. least it requires somebody. And this is what, this is what is of, of the three rationalists. Spinoza is the one that clearly has the most personal courage and integrity. It requires not only his brilliance, but his, his deep moral courage and integrity uh, to take the stand he took. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, great. Thank you. That historical context, you know, definitely uh, sheds light on it. Now, you mentioned that he wanted to, I forget the word you used, extract or, or separate the credo, the, the, the religio from the credo. Yeah. Well, then, where then would he then reattach the credo? To what? So for him, he, for, for example, uh, so no, not for example, first, he would say, he wants to change the relationship and make, I would, using my language, the credo would always be in service of the religio, not the other way around. Um, and, and, and he thought that that credo could be reestablished uh, uh, through rational reflection uh, upon um, the scientific worldview. Okay. And you have to understand that, and, and, I'll, I'll, and it, it's very tempting with, Spinoza to think that he means by reason logic, because the ethics is written, like it's written like you, it's written like Euclid's right geometry. It is a logical 
treat us through and through. But that's not ultimately what um, Spinoza means by reason. He means ratio. He means uh, he means right relationship uh, to things. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so he thought that that sense of rational, rational reflection upon the scientific worldview and upon the existing religions that he was in dialogue with would allow him to craft a credo that was more responsive and responsible to the religio properly understood. So in a very real sense, he was doing something very analogous to the project that I've engaged in, which I call the religion that's not a religion. In fact, Spinoza is one of my heroes in that endeavor. And that's why Clara Carlyle's book, Spinoza's Religion, is so important, I would okay. argue. And so, and what, what role does the mythos play in that, that yeah, and, and so this is this is the really interesting thing in Spinoza. Um, so he's generally seen as you know a precursor to Boltzmann and others, and that he is. I, I think I got the right name. In, in that he 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 wants to in many ways demythologize religion, and you and I would immediately go, that's problematic. But the thing is, many people. Um, oh, what's her name? Genevieve Lloyd has gone back and said, no, no, actually Spinoza is trying to. Although he's very critical of the imagination, he is actually trying to engage in a recovery of the imagination. Mm. And, and I have to go into this more. So I'm, the next thing I'm saying, I want it to be understood. I'm saying it very cautiously. No, you know, I, I, but I think he was moving towards an understanding of the imaginal sense of the imagination and criticizing the imaginary sense of the imagination. Um, and so, um, mm. and I think insofar as the imaginal uh, could be reintegrated with the rational, uh, there would be a kind of mythos available uh, to him. He, he is willing to acknowledge the role of mythos and that he, he, in fact, he often, I think he's one of the first people to propose and he often proposes uh, well, no, that's not fair. There's the whole allegorical reading, which, or, or sorry, the spiritual reading, the spiritual reading in the Middle Ages. But he, in the, in, right, in early modernity, he's proposing reinterpreting, right, these, the, a lot of the Bible as mythos that can then be understood uh, in this rational, imaginal sense. All right. So that all makes a lot of sense. Like I think, and I also, it, it, it makes it clear to me what our projects are in, yeah. and, and yeah. Um, sort of in some sense, what we're up against the, the, the historical inertia, how, and I hear you engaging, I hear you engaging with the modern residue of yeah. that, yeah. that world, uh, that axial age and later uh, you know, power structure. Um, do you think that we are still, um, do you think that we're still under the spell of that, those dynamics? Yeah. Very and, much so, very much so. Yeah. And do you see that how your work can uh, in some ways, um, ameliorate and offer us an off-ramp to that 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 that, those habits of 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 sort of how can we open up how can we elevate this conversation based on what we now know scientifically uh in in such a way that there that that the antagonism it, it can be you know attenuated in some way that that we can get beyond that old these old these old dichotomies these old patterns and then begin to really crap move into something live into something <laughs> bigger and you know, more inclusive and less less hostile that that, that is the, thank you for that 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 is that that is the sort of pivot challenge of my work uh, that's the, that's the fulcrum point of everything i'm trying to do and uh, and socrates famous said uh, he who wants to move the world must f- first move himself. Um, and so this is not, what I mean by that is this is not something I can propose sort of third person theoretical. Um, this is deeply also 
first personal uh, for me. Um, uh, and so. I, I, I know that you've had that. I know that you've yeah. had that. You, you have a history with the, the, the contours of, 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 of religious life, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's clear that it's personal. It's not only that, that of course is part of what I meant. Um, and I don't want to lose that, but I also meant that um, the, the reformulation, that's not quite the word. The, the, I like the word inventio or reinventio. Mm -hmm. The reinventio that I'm uh, undertaking is not one that can take place at just the theoretical level. It requires that Socratic commitment to, to and the spinazistic commitment to profound mm -hmm. realization and transformation. It, it, so it's not so it's 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 something I have to undergo, not merely propose. All right, um, or or maybe better, I can only authentically propose it in a way that might be effective if I am also committing myself to undergoing it as radically as I possibly uh, sort of can. Uh, that's mm -hmm. that's what I was also, uh, which is again very Socratic, very and that's very much the case also with Spinoza. Spinoza was right. He was in depth. He was. He was undergoing um, the sapiential self-transcendence into the blessed life. And he was trying to convey that as much as say that uh, mm -hmm. to, to people. So that's that's what I meant. And I do, and I do, I do think that's important because I think the movement that that inventio is, is, is exactly what is needed in order to get into that place where. Yeah, that combative relationship between science and religion has been alleviated uh, or, or at least ameliorated to some significant degree. I, I do, I, what, I, what, I, what I hope to, do, there's sort of two things that are happening. Um, one is, and I don't know how much I can separate them. I'm sorry I'm taking a while on this, Rich, but it's a hard question and I wanna answer it carefully. Um, one is, and I know this happens because many people say it to me and it happens, um, insofar as I am trying to craft like Spinoza, a, a new conceptual vocabulary, a new, new theoretical grammar and a new, uh, praxis of ritual, uh, uh, uh ecology of practices, right? Insofar as I'm trying to do that, um, I'm affording many people to do, and I mean this word the way Tolkien means it, to recover their religion, which I, I think really means uh, to get back to right relationship uh, with religio and with reality. Uh, and I, that's happening. Um, and it's also, it's, a, it's allowing people to, who have not uh, or ha had a religious upbringing or who have rejected it for powerful mm -hmm. reasons like trauma, abuse, uh, et cetera, are nevertheless finding a way in which they can come to a non-autodidactic, they can come to a shared and shareable kind of uh, spirituality. We need a better word. That's an axial age word and we need a better word, right? Um, and those two are actually, those two movements are actually, and this is not something I in any way foresaw or planned. It's something I'm realizing as it's occurring, and I hope I'm realizing it accurately. Those two groups find that they can talk to each other quite readily. They don't come to an agreement, but the people who are doing this sort of recovery of the depths of the legacy of the Axel Age religion, recovery of religio, right? And the people who are engaging in the inventio of religio as nuns actually find that not just through my work, my work and Jonathan's work and other people's work, Jonathan Pajot and other, that they can talk to each other in a really mutually transformative, mutually edifying manner. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily come to join each other's organizations. Paul Vanderclay has this wonder, wonderful metaphor of the estuary where the salt water and the fresh water mix. And as you know, estuaries are profound places for evolutionary change because uh, of the volatility, the volatility, how volatile. They're also, they're also incredibly peaceful places for the most yeah, part. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so um, I think that's an apt uh, metaphor uh, for 
how I see this, how I see my work and, and the work of all of these people in this little corner of the internet, uh, uh, which, you, which you now belong to, um, is um, that's how I see it's, it, it's addressing that issue. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know where it's going to go. I do, there is a tremendous, I, and I, I am really disappointed I wasn't able to go to the Emerge Conference in Austin because I got trapped in New Brunswick. Uh, but there is this, this palpable sense of something is emerging right now and it's growing in momentum and it's growing in depth. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I, can't, I can't give you sort of a, a clear account that sort of renders a complete intelligibility that's the answer to your question. I can point to these sort of two movements and the relationship they have to each other and they're somehow together riding this wave of emergence. That's the best answer I can give. Okay. Well, <clears throat> thank you for that. Um, it's a good, it's a good update and a good reminder of where we where we are. I'd I'd like to. Uh, there's a couple of things. First of all, in our last conversation, we you know I, I kept asking you the question like, why are you talking to me? And you were very generous in explaining why and clear. And I, but I also I think I want to take just a quick opportunity to. To also cover why I'm interested in talking to you. Okay. And I, it was the first thing I said to you actually in our first conversation. I talked about how your your depth of inquiry and your you know just your your you you your com, your incredible capacity to learn you know to investigate and to research in a scholarly way. And I don't mean this in a in a, in, in so much as a complimentary way as a way as a functional way, you've got this incredible depth of in propositional and, you know, intellectual knowledge that's based on your investigation. Plus you are um, allowing yourself to uh, a participant observer and in, in, in a, in a uh, very diverse community of people. I think those two things aren't just by accident. I think it's the one that actually gives permission and, and enables and uh, the, 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 the latter. So this is why I, I want to talk to you because I think that your, the confidence that you've got in your groundedness in the literature and in the scholarship and in the historical, you know, uh, story um, gives you a kind of um, a power, a strength, a, something to stand on that's pretty solid which allows you to then consider things that may be further afield that may be more esoteric maybe more ethereal and out there and um in light of that i i think and in light of what you just said about the community and these two communities coming together to have this dialogue i'd like to propose a kind of free radical into that community, which is nature itself, right. which is this thing that Spinoza, you know, referred to and could feel and could, could embody and bring that directly to the conversations that are happening out there in, in a way that's like, we, I think we need to elevate and, um, you know, really get more sophisticated in how we do that. How, because it's not just nature as in, you know, the natural world, but nature as in yeah. the reality as in the universe as in what science has been able to um decipher what, sci what science has been able to show us about how it works and, and because if you do that and if you do that in a very thoughtful careful rigorous way you realize that the imaginal and the imaginary as well are are integral that you know that they are not separate from yeah. this this overall endeavor and, and 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 somewhere in there somewhere in this, this this sort of courageous opening to the natural world as something greater than what we currently perceive it as somewhere within there is this opening and 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 there this is where the breakthrough is the breakthrough that's yet to happen mm -hmm. that and it's a breakthrough that can you know dissolve and 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 um um deconstruct all these patterns of 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 conflict because there's this there's this 
immensely unifying uh, uh, aspect to it. I'm not yeah. sure if this is making any sense or not, but I- It's perfect sense. You're, you're being, in fact, eloquent, so keep going. Well, I just, I wanna figure out ways to do this seriously, not just as a sort of hobby or as a commitment to an ideology, but because it is essential for us. It is essential for us in living full lives and it's essential in for us to persist yes. you, you know th 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 that that there's no guarantee that our species and our form and our who we are will continue but we need to do everything that we can if we if we love ourselves to to try and do that you know so it's not just an exercise in philosophy or right. ethical examination or even like you know some it, it, you know even though it doesn't necessarily it's not just a hedonistic thing either even though there is great pleasure to be found this is the sort of this is the hidden gem this is the sort of saving grace of it all is that there is this incredible source of pleasure in and in, in it but but that we need to do this in order to get through this bottleneck we need to and you know and again as always this isn't a utopianist vision it's it's a pragmatic vision and yeah. so um that's what I want to sort of interject into this, into this, that, that the earth, earthly nature, the nature that we encounter on a daily basis here on this planet needs a seat at that table right. and uh, in ways that can be accessible to us and that can be integrated into us in an intimate way, not just a universal out there way, but in a very deep in here way. That, yeah. obliterate, that obliterates that sort of that, that dichotomy between in and out. Yeah, exactly. And so um, I want to explore, you know, how we can do that in a way that is just um, that I can hear in conversations that I'm not hearing now. So um, I, I, I think the imagery of the seat at the table is very profound and important. So let's not lose that. Um, what I can, let, let's start maybe bottom up because uh, I'm in co conversation and trying to do genuine community building with other people um, mm. around this. And many of these communities are trying to find a way to give nature a seat at the table or uh, how I've put it, they're trying to allow nature to, to speak um, in the process. Um, I'll give you two examples, and I'm not claiming that these are exhaustive. They're, they're meant to be exemplary. So part of Rafe Kelly's Evolve Move Play is you go out and do parkour in nature. You are literally conforming yourself dynamically yeah, to the dynamic beautiful. patterns of the environment. And that is, an, that is an irremovable part of his ecology because that is, that is the, and then he also does sit sitting where you're sitting and you're opening up and letting, right? So he is, he's got practices that give nature a voice. Benita Roy does this very interesting thing where she has people work with horses as opposed to other human beings and to try mm -hmm. and enter into dialogical relationship with non-humans mm -hmm. in order to give that side of things a voice. And she claims, and, and I believe her because I, I know her and she is not a person given to woo or to or, or to self-congratulation. She says a lot of the most transformative things actually happen in the communing communication between humans and horse that it, right, it, that's irremovable, that you can't capture it by just doing something between human beings. So, and there are other examples. I'm just pulling those out as way, and I think this is an important point and we need to foreground it and explicate it and then reflect upon it uh, because um, it, it is definitely something that I have been neglectful of in the ecology of practices. Uh, I, I used to be more responsible to it, uh, but I, I, in fact, I, I want to thank you for bringing this up because it now it's just making this crystallize in my mind, right? This, this giving nature a seat at the table by giving it an actual voice within the transformative process, right? Um, and there are, there, there's two examples, there's others of people who have figured out a way in which an ecology of practice includes giving voice to nature in a profound way. I would now want to make a proposal, 
and I'm making it for the first time. I think, because we're talking a lot about this, about what I've, what I've been calling the, the design features of an ecology of practice. I, I think this should be a design, and I've been talking about, you know, you need opponent processing and layering and, and virtual engineering and all this stuff. And I think that's all right. But I now think a design feature should be, you know, aligning the four kinds of knowing, but I think a design feature should be, um, every ecology of practice should in some important way, give voice to nature within the ecology of practices. Beautiful. I think, I think this has just, I, I obviously it's an idea you've had, but it, it's just come clear to me right now. And I think that, I yes. think that, that is, I, I want to thank you. I think this. Well, 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 and, and, and here's the thing, John, I think, and this, I think this will appeal to you that these, th these practices that you mentioned between Rafe and also Benita, they make perfect sense to me that both of those, both yeah. of those activities, both of those practices will deeply and, you know, help you embody, especially, you know, yeah. whether it's through the grit of the trail and, or the grip on the, the root as you're swinging from it or whatever it is, you yeah. know, that is really powerful way to feel yeah. as, as is with, you know, with something like a horse. I mean, could you, could you pick, you know, you couldn't pick a better animal with this huge eyes that has this way of inviting you in and is like really suspicious of us and sent, asks us and demands us to be present with it in order to, you know, yeah. so those yeah. things are, yeah, they're beautiful examples of the phenomenology of, of it. And, and here's the thing I think you might appreciate is that how, how can we ground that phenomenology in that mythos? That's the question. It's like, and there is one, there is one, and it's, and it's a rich conceptual, uh, it's a rich conceptual matrix of, of, of knowledge that we have that actually gives, that, that validates those experiences beyond yes. just being, you know, hairy, fairy uh, spiritual experiences. Actually, no, these are, these are grounded. These are empirical, grounded in the, the best scientific knowledge. Yes ways of experiencing like the true depths or you know start to plumb the depths of nature the sacredness of nature they're not just things that we conjure but these are callings like this is like nature this is how nate this is what intelligibility is for it yes. is it, it, it's for us to be able to access these this this what it seems, appears to be infinite source of creativity and wisdom and love yeah. It's in there. So can we can we formalize it within the mythos from which the credo then can spring? Oh, so let's pick that up. But I first want to, I just want to, again, you, there's gems coming out here. So when you said, you know, it's a calling, Yaden has this work, this recent anthology, the sense of being called, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and this is one of the things that distinguishes a ritual from just a pretense, right? Because yeah. Uh, the, the serious play, you, you're, you're being called by something other than yourself. Uh, that's all this work I'm doing on ritual right now, it, it, right? I would call the parkour and the interaction with a horse ritual precisely because it's the imaginal it, that affords a calling from something um, and a calling for, from something that has a, a, a something like a, a justified ontological status and claim upon us. Like you said, it's not just a <laughs> conjuring. Like, we do the ritual and we're feeling called, but we also have this like this ontology that says, ah, but there is something really there uh, doing the calling. I, I, and I agree with that. Uh, for me, um, I, 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 I'm trying, I mean, so, and this is happening right now. Okay, so I was talking to Cheryl Tissue and uh, Nathan uh, Vanderpool they're doing uh, the thing in Berlin where they've got artists together. They, they've all committed to the five precepts and they are trying to engage in ritual um, that le ritual and imaginal, they're trying to gauge into the inventio of ritual art that is trying to be at exactly this nexus point. And they're doing it communitas, they're living together. They're talking to me. They want me to be sort of the advisor. I don't know how I'm getting these positions. They're weird, uh, but right. And they want me to be sort uh, of- Makes the, perfect sense. Uh, they want me to be the advisor. Thank you. They want me to be the advisor to that. And, and they're also going, and, and uh, in return, they're going to allow me to do, be sort of the ethnographic uh, observer of it. So they are, you know, th this communitas, ritual, imaginal art, they're trying to make the mythos. 
but that's even the wrong word. That's why I want to use the word inventio. They're trying to discover make. That's what inventio means. They're trying inventio the mythos, right? Okay, but, okay. Before we get too far, I just want to circle back for one second into when I said conjuring. I didn't mean to use the adjective just because I don't think it's just. I think conjuring is actually a very powerful and real. In fact, it's a natural phenomena. So I don't want to dismiss the conjuring as like something that should yeah, be dismissed. Yeah, it's yeah. actually, it's, it's, you know, I usually use the phrase fake it to make, fake it to make it. And I mean, there's, there's a, there is a reciprocal uh, way to do conjuring that is very real and very, can be very experiential. Um, that's, that's what I properly mean by the imaginal dimension of the, of yes. That's right. exactly what I mean by it. Right. And so, um, and when I say mythos, what I'm referring to is that there is this body of knowledge that we can plumb and every insight in this scientific body of knowledge. You know, I'm a geologist in, you know, and a biologist and ecologist, but, yeah. but when I look at the geologic record, you know, what, what springs out at me is are, are the stories of our becoming. You know, this is our story. These aren't just trilobites on the bottom of the ocean. There are things happening down there that that implicate the earth and the, and the physicality of the earth, the salt, the, the, the fact that salt water is an electrolyte, the fact that gravity is a certain strength that on this size, all these things conspire to like, to, to, to make us, to, for us, that is our story. And it goes all the way back through the history of the earth and all the way back to the beginning of the cosmos, if, if, if you want, if you choose to. And so when I say mythos, that's what I mean. And so I guess what I'm saying is, is it's the one part that I see somewhat absent from this inventio uh, um, movement that you're talking about is this, is the, is, is the calling in of knowledge, scientific knowledge to, you know, to, to help us tell these, this, this story. And um, I just think it's an essential part because it amplifies the phenomenology in a way that's hard to articulate. Uh, it's hard to say. I think that's a legitimate criticism in the, in the constructive sense of that word. Uh, part of it is ignorance on my part. The science I do is cognitive science. I do not have uh, the deep training um, in, um, in, in and, and I have kind of yeah. um, uh, an amateur in the sense of the lover, uh, but my son is, got formally trained in biology and we do a lot and I did philosophy mm. and biology and so I've got some of bio, a bit of biology but I don't I, I I don't I mean but there is the natural world the natural world too this isn't this isn't necessarily an you know a pedagogical process it's actually uh it's, it's an experiential process that the world is constantly showing sending us these signals and telling us these things and 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 cueing us to like to know more to know close to know more deeply and so, and that goes towards the, 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 the sort of realization I had a few minutes ago about practices that are attuning us so that we become properly receptive to those signals again. So, but I hear you saying, good, and, and you were very, those are very good practices, but there needs to be something that gathers the signals together into and makes sense of them together, uh, a framework. And you think that um, the scientific framework is already can do that for us. In my actually, I think I, I actually I, I tend toward the big history framework, which is narrative. In in, in I don't, you know, I, I guess I'm, again I'm a little hesitant to use big history for various reasons. But the deep history, the the cosmic history, the natural history, is a story. Deep, you know, yes. And and that's more what I think. It's when I say body of knowledge, I don't mean just this body of facts. I mean it is a coherent continuum of, 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 of evolution that we can, it's a story to be told. It's a story to behold. It's a story to be. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, let me tell you uh, how I've approached it, but also the wariness I have around that. So I've approached it with, you know, basically through the work of uh, 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 Alicia Urero and her idea that narrative puts us in, it actually organizes our, our cognition so that we're capable of picking up on the dynamical patterns, uh, which you you know we we can actually pick up on uh, the deep history to your your uh, of, okay. of things, and so for me, I I I I I 
I give voice to that and I have, and I, I, I will come back to it again and again and again, but I have, but I have two things that concern me. One is, um, so for example, one of the things that's talked about in ritual, uh, the ritual language, uh, sorry, the ritual studies, people like Jennings and Shubrek and Williams and Boyd and, right, is they, 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 they say they want a non-reductive account of ritual. And, and what do they mean by that? So they say, we suffer in a Protestant rain shadow. This is not, I'm not trying to diss Protestantism, but one of the things Protestantism did is it put word above sacrament. The word was more important. The text was more important than the sacrament. Yeah. And so we, what we've tended to do is to see ritual as the enactment of a text. And so it's a demonstration or a pedagogical thing, but it, right. And many people, and I agree with them are saying, no, no, no. Ritual is not right. Just mm. the enactment of text. It is sacrament independent of word. It has a sacramental, it is a sacramental process. And, the, and, and so the, the, the problem I have, right, is there's a tendency to, to, to absolutize narrative, uh, especially within the axial age legacy religions. Gotcha. Right? And, and then that also often bleeds into something that I'm very wary of, which is sort of a, which postmodernism has been trying to criticize, which is sort of a teleological view of nature. Right, and those two things I'm very wary of because for me, they, we, they are actually missing central things that were disclosed by the scientific revolution. So that's, I, like, I, I wanna acknowledge that narrative has, the, I keep wanting to say two things. Narrative is necessary, it's indispensable, it's a, ne it's a powerful tool, but precisely because of that, it is capable of becoming an idol. Totally okay. understood, totally okay. understood. Now, let me see if I can't add a, a, a facet to, to consider, which is, so we, we talk about, so I think we would agree that narrative, storytelling, this capacity for storytelling of organizing and structuring our experiences in, in some kind of linear fashion that gives them structure, gives them durability so that we can carry them in memory or wherever they are carried, that, 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 that narrative has become this thing that we depend on. In fact, we make meaning of it. It's just a central, it's so central that we can't see it. You know, it's, it's, it's become invisible to us and, we, and, 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 and as such, we become somewhat entrapped by it. We become yep. enslaved to narratives until we're given, until we become aware of narratives and then at which point we can free ourselves or, or at least begin to re-edit, re-author new stories by which to live. So yep. narrative is huge. And I think, you know, uh, uh, Nuval Harari Sapiens makes the claim, you know, that, that it is this capacity for storytelling, for holding fictions and believing and living them as if they were true is what makes us so successful yep. and so dominant. Okay. But the question is, well, where did we get that capacity? Literally, like where did the capacity for storytelling as an intellectual, as an embodied process come from? And this is what, you know, I talk about this thing called, I teach this thing called earthling theory, which is basically this account of human history when, you know, this diaspora out of Africa, before we left, we, 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 we had, when modern humans, it's a complicated story, but when modern humans left the African continent, you know, we had already had this long and sustained relationship with many of the habitats of, of the African continent. And one of the things that we had developed was this capacity to create stone tools. Yeah. And there's this whole industry of different stone tools, old one, Ishwelian, Mysterian. And you can see the evolution of how these things got more and more sophisticated. And, but what you see in the earliest, the old one, you know, these 3.5 million year old stone tools, which are very crude, is uh, a hominid or, or an australopithecine taking a stone tool and fashioning it in such a way that it would be more effective at, say, you know, tearing the fiber off of a nutcase so that we could get to the meat of the nuts and we could, you know, feed our family. But the point is this, that when, 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 when the, the, the Australopithecine does that, when they take a stone and, and, and hit it with another stone and fashion the tool, they're seeing a, a sequence of causal events. They're seeing the past and the present and the future in this linear sort of way. And they're using that 
capacity to 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 thrive. Yeah. But we're it comes from the rock as much as it comes from the from the hominid. It's the it's the rock that's 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 impinging on the on the hominid as much as the hominid is impinging on the rock. And yeah. so it's this. But what we're seeing is the emergence of story. We're seeing that we're seeing a very primitive form of that storytelling capacity in the stone tools. And so, but but what we fail to recognize is that it's not just coming from the hominid, it's coming from the earth. This is a rock, it's a piece of earth that's teaching us how to tell stories. Mm. And this is the thing that's missing. I don't I forget why I'm on this track, but but oh, because of your suspicion or your sort of your caution around narrative, which is well founded. But the point is that we don't ever ask, well, where did we get this capacity? And it was, it's a gift from the earth. And you know, we could fill out the details of this. It, like at every step of the way, as we watch these stone tools evolve, they get more and more. Well, the next phase of stone tools actually takes on this incredibly symmetrical, beautiful, faceted surface. Yeah. And it has it's perfectly designed for it to be actually it's not perfectly held. It's not perfectly designed. It's actually designed with a sharp edge that goes all the way around it. Because what we're seeing is this, whoever made it, the habilis or whoever it was, they made it less functional as a tool in order to make it more aesthetically appealing. So it's like we see, we yeah. see this, like we see this gradual or abrupt sophistication and we see the earth constantly sort of egging and nudging us into more and more sophisticated and cre And by the time you get, you know, the, 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 the modern humans leaving Africa, we're leaving with this highly developed sense of, of storytelling and aesthetic value and even the capacity for metaphor, which is all, all recorded in the stone tools. But what's lost in this is that art, which is a further, you know, when you get to, to, to you know, like Western Europe where the cave art, you know, they just see this incredibly beautiful and abstract parietal art on cave walls we've lost this sense that that was the earth that is us expressing the earth's gifts the endowment of the earth and so i guess i'm offering this as a way of saying that yes narrative can be abused but i think it's it, it's more inclined to be abused when we don't know where it comes from if we don't have this grounding narrative that grounds us in the process of the earth then then we'd be, we'd be more inclined to use this power for inhumane things for in for you know to further separate and this is what we see happening we see this capacity for um really creative abstract expression being um being um um appropriated to serve an ideology or one one ideology or another which is you know which is now you know and, and this is our inheritance we've inherited that and now i think we're in a moment where we need to recover remember those that earlier form of art which is one that was deeply you know uh, uh, d d deeply connected to our experience of, of of the habitats of this earth Sorry if this has gone way off track. No, no, no it hasn't. It hasn't. I, 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 I think it's instrumental. I want to try. I want to try and do something convergent with it, not a not alternative, but convergent. So, um, and, and one of the, one of the central conceptual metaphors for narrative is journey. Uh, we talk about you know the beginning and the middle and the end, and we move through a story and we start here and we end up there. We use mm -hmm. the journey, uh, and I think I think it uh, uh, another important source of narrative, and it, it it even better I think gives voice to uh, the earth is, um, is 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 tracking. Um, so when you're tr so when you're tracking an animal. Mm are following a course and you're reading signs but like if you watch especially uh, like i've seen the song film of the song hunting um and they will stop and if they lose sight of the animal they will they will take they will imagine all they will become mm -hmm. the antelope mm -hmm. so that they they what because if it becomes the antelope and they go the antelope went that way because as they become the ant so they're taking on characters they're moving it's imaginal it's inherently fictional but in the sense that's also factual right it, it's imaginal and because fictive means to make and so does fact right um and, and so 
they are right they are moving on a winding journey and right it, that has a beginning a, a, a middle of problem solving it has an end to it they are taking on characters and they're right and they're doing all of this and what they're doing is they're, they're that's as you said the earth is is speaking to them it is signing to them it is giving them significance the animal is speaking to them as they are enacting it and that for me it is proto-narrative and, and why i say that is because right that um that tracking ability it seems mm. you know the, that as we 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 have exacted that in order to track through conceptual space our navigate i'm, I'm proposing to you that our navigational and our narrative abilities are are are, are co-evolving <laughs> and and then we actually exact those into how we move through conceptual space because what narrative science gives us causal principles narrative allows us to track causal pathways and that's something very different yes. from what science does right and that, that so that's why you know you don't get a scientific answer to why did napoleon uh, uh but that, that's army. okay because to do good science you've got to kind of constrain it in that sense and that's you know, like that's just a trade off that i think good scientists are willing that, to make that, that exactly is and that's why things like uh, darwin's theory of evolution are so important because they move between the nomological structure of things like physics and the narrative structures that we find in history, because you have there's a historical dimension that's yes, built yes. into that very, yes, which yes. is why I think the which is why ah, I but but so limited though like the, the, the Darwin's the, the, our, our our initial conceptions or our initial interpretations of what that meant or what it could mean are so limited, and it's and, it, and, and I was I was actually about to say what. This is why the philosophy of biology, I think, is the most important philosophy of yeah. science right now, because precisely trying to explicate and, and correct uh, the, uh, our understanding of that, which like my, my colleague at UFT, Dennis Walsh, is doing in his work. So for yeah. me, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not dismissing the, the, the stool, the, the tool making as, uh, but I'm saying, but it, notice how it's gonna be bound up with it, but the tracking has so much uh, proto narrative yeah. in it. I, I, Absolutely. Right? Well, but but the capacity to even do that though had to had to have a precursor, and yeah. you know, and and it, again, it's this constant sort of nudging, calling, impinging yeah. on upon what we're doing. It's speaking to us all the time, and we've just what we've just so lost that. And and part of and I don't want to go into grievance mode here, but part of the conversations that I hear out there, they don't really take any of this into account. They say, I deduce that this is the nature of reality and everything I see is gonna, is gonna, we need to step, we need to just get disrupted from that. Yes. Anyway, I, we don't need to go there, but I, yeah, I see what you're saying is like a, a whole, a, a, a really rich uh, dimension of this, this story. By the way, this story goes further back. It goes further back into, in, in, into um you know more simple organisms oh yeah did you, did you, the, the, did you see the conversation i had with michael levin no i wouldn't oh, like to see that rich you got to see that all okay. right good right where and, is it and, well uh, you just send me the, the channel link. the meaning code michael levin we're going to have another conversation okay. amazing like the the deep like he yeah taking taking uh you know intelligence down to the depths yes. of the cells uh, uh like well cells. even further too like and so this is where yeah. i don't know if you've been following like I just started to think, listen to this Douglas Hoffman, who's talking about, um, yeah. um, um, I, I would not be able to do it justice, but how consciousness is fundamental. And that once you, once you do that, once you adopt a sort of uh, an evolutionary, an evolutionary approach, plus define a probability space, you realize that uh, space time is really just a myth. Space time is a construct, a construct. And what's actually primary is consciousness, which my point in saying that is that I think this intelligence that we call consciousness or cognition or whatever you want to call it actually isn't isn't just biological. It's 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 part of a physical universe. It's part of. Levin goes further down. He go, he goes okay. He, he goes deeper down. Um, I think I, that's inevitable. Right. I, I won't get into it. I have very deep uh, criticisms of Hoffman. I think he's making a oh, okay. That's in really exactly the wrong way around. Yeah. I, he's redoing Kant, and I think that's a mistake. I think we should we we should properly uh, try to, and let go of Kant. Um, I, can you give me the gist of it so I can try it out? Uh, uh, the idea that consciousness. So, how does he know that consciousness exists? 
Well, I, I well, okay. <laughs> what he question. does, what Kant does, is he gives a privileged, epistemic, unjustified relationship to conscious. So I know my qualia directly. Why? How? Do you have qualia about your qualia? Well, no. Well, then why do you need in this intervening thing? Like, this is part of a long philosophical critique of yes. this whole framework that, you know, start that, 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 you know, and Spinoza was actually part of the, the, the yes. first person to try and critique it. And, and, you know, and you get the Heideggerian critique and the Wittgensteinian critique and then the, the postmodern critique. You can't just sort of ignore all of that and say, let's go back and say, right, it's, a, it's all a Kantian, con that's Kant's view that you know the space and time are are just constructs that's that's explicitly what he argues for in the critique of pure reason and the problem you have with that is, is you what you end up doing is you end up privileging some epistemic relation without justification for example you i'm going to make use of all these evolutionary arguments so evolution is real how is that how do you know that out there there's evolution but you don't know right like you you like you you have to do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like it, when you try to make everything a property of con I mean, Bernardo and I had a, a long arguments about this. You get into some very problematic places about it. And I'm worried, and this is not the case with Bernardo. Bernardo is very, uh, very consistent in challenging a subjective solipsistic thing. Uh, like my question to Hoffman would be, and how do you know there's not only just your consciousness? If it's all a construct, how do you know that there's any other minds? I'm not sure he's saying that consciousness is the construct. He's saying that the space-time, uh, the, the no, way... No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm saying consciousness is the constructor. Um, how do you know there's only one, not only one? How do I know there's not only one what? Consciousness? Yeah, constructor. As far as I can tell, all I've got from you is space and time and behavior. And if they're not real, then how are you real to me? Um, yeah, we may be getting beyond my pay grade, but... Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, but that's it. So I, I, we don't have to resolve... But, 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 but I would say, yeah, okay. I, I would just suggest one thing. You said that we can't ignore Kant. We can't ignore the lineage of thought that... But what if we did? Like my question would be, what if we did ignore that for a moment and say, and just look at what we have recorded in the fossil record or in the, uh, you know, in, in the astronomical record, like look, instead of thinking about how later uh, versions of cognition tried to interpret reality, let's, let's temporarily suspend all of that. Let's temporarily ignore that and consider the purely naturalistic uh, evolution of, 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 of energy informed by, you know, informed energy. Let's, let's consider that and then see where consciousness shows up and how it shows up later on down the evolutionary path. Uh, so well, what I would say to you there is um, science never takes place in a conceptual vacuum. Uh, sure. Right. Sure. So, so okay. and, and there's a, there's a worldview, there's a framework, there's, you know, even the idea that, you know, um, the presupposition that mathematical measurement is the way. Absolutely. The, right? Actually, like, I think, I think we actually agree. Like I'm, 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 I'm very, very, very critical of science actually. Okay. And, and, we, and what we, what we ask it or expect it to be able to do. Um, and so I, I'm not arguing that the scientific worldview, I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the coherent narrative that has, that has, dropped it's you know that we have been able to discern which of course is not complete it's of course it's not yeah, it, yeah. It, it's impossible that it would be complete in fact so, so i agree yeah. with you then so let's say we're in agreement then i would say i think you i would propose to you or ask you to consider that you might be in a deep disagreement with hoffman at that level perhaps but what i am also saying is that so many of the things that he says and maybe this is the lure of it is that it, it? It makes sense to the phenomenology that I that I that I happen to hold, that I happen to you know happen upon. Uh, that, but but when I say consciousness, especially in these pre sort of sophisticated forms of our particular, yeah, our particular our particular biology is capable of that. Conscious, I'm not projecting this form of consciousness onto the cosmos. 
it's something much different. It, no, not different, but it's on a continuum anyway. But it, 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 we, we, I wouldn't look at it and say, well, that's consciousness. But I would say it's a precursor to consciousness. And, and that's, yes, and I think that's right. But you see, you are, it, it, throughout what I've heard you say, you're ultimately thinking that, right, there, that there's a reality. You're being a realist about these things. He, also, he, at least I've heard him say it in multiple places, thinks that your phenomenology is actually a simulation. It's not, a, it's not disclosing reality to you. It's actually showing you that you're in a simulation, which is very problematic. Because I think, like you, that there's a real story about a real universe. Uh, that there is, but I don't think it's the whole story, obviously. I, I, and I know you would agree with that, too. But, that... But, 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 but see, but, but, but oh, okay, so here maybe is the pivot point. <laughs> if partial knowledge doesn't count as real knowledge, we are deeply screwed because you face Mino's paradox. Mino's paradox is, goes like this, right? If I know it, I don't need to learn it. And if I don't know it, I can't possibly recognize it. That's in Plato. And the way out uh, and the way everybody comes back to is partial knowledge. I have partial knowledge that guides me. And so partial knowledge has to be real knowledge. And if partial knowledge is falsity or illusion or simulation, mm -hmm. you are trapped in Mino's paradox. Yeah, and that's where I mean where you're trapped inside your head in a profound way. Okay. I, 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 I don't feel trapped inside my head. So yeah. I, 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 I must be okay with partial knowledge. In fact, I think it's the fact that it is partial is the kind of clue that we are continuous with it because yes, I we can never hold it all. And, or, or, or whatever that other part is that, you know, is, is the thing that binds us to it. Yes. Is, I get something like that. So I agree. Um, and, I, and I think that's the, and I think that is the deep platonic answer. That's why it's Philea Sophia. We are lovers of wisdom because we yes. all have only partial knowledge, but that partial knowledge yes. has real capacity to call to us further us and further yes. and further yes. in. Yes. Yes. That, and, that's and, and that's and, and it's is it by accident that's that's a deeply uh, pleasurable experience. Yes. I doubt it. I think we're evolved for that pleasure. Yeah, we're, very much. Very I, much. I, I feel that. So this has to be useful. Like this, you know, wherever we land on Hoffman or whatever you wherever there's something deeply unifying, deeply transformative about this way of being in the world. And, and I, 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 I see nature singing this every day. Like yes. it's yes. everything I encounter is saying is, is sort of saying, yes, you're right, Rich. Yes. Okay. And that has a profound effect on the way that I live and the way that I just, my, 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 just my attitude toward the world. And so it's gotta be useful. We've got to figure out a way to like, Again, bring it to the table. Bring. Yeah. Now, I, I could be wrong, but it feels like my, 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 my investigation, my exploration of the natural world, has somehow given access to the intelligence that creates the intelligence that's that's there that's been that's unfolding. Fin that's Spinoza's claim. I don't. I don't find it. Uh, I don't find it an absurd claim. I, I, I don't think I don't find it absurd either, but I but I think everything we've learned since Spinoza is 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 showing us is saying the same thing. It's and and somehow we're off contemplating some you know some chapter of the Bible or some credo that's like didn't know any of this stuff. And so I I I, I guess I'm just again <laughs> just sorry to harp on it, but I just think that there's something really valuable in this in this exploration and this relationship to nature that can that can empower us to to i think you're right and i do think along i think like i said i think it should be a design feature and i want to extend it a little bit in recognition of what you've what you've been arguing for very well by the way uh, first of all oh and I, I um so i guess we're running out of time here but uh, i i just did want to mention because you mentioned the artists and uh, I'm actually deeply involved with artists. Uh, it's a small handful of artists. This is a cohort that sort of evolved. And these are, um, these are people that uh, they're very sensitive to the natural world. They, have a, they already have a very, uh, you know, this abiding sort of understanding and relationship with nature. And we are exploring in many, like the ways you say about communitas and, and, and fellowship and apprenticeship and all that. 
we are we're we're doing deep immersions into nature, uh, letting ourselves be open to what it has to teach us, or, or you know, and then bringing that to the art. If it, but it it has it's got to be, and this is where kind of my research comes in. There has to be this motivated use element to it, where you spend time in the natural world in this open state. It gets into you, and then you transport it somewhere else, which is sort of the 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 you know, the confirmation that it's in you. And then you bring it to the art, and then the art brings it to the culture. That, that, that's exactly what I was going to say. I was going to say, now I wanted to say, I wanted to add to my initial proposal, the design feature should have uh, practices in which nature speaks to us, like parkour and the horses, but we also need an artistic. Uh, uh, right? And an intellectual, I think. And, and the intellectual, the intellectual is, is going to happen uh, in any ecology of practices. I, I'm, I'm not worried okay. about that as a design feature. I'm worried about things that are live right now. I'm worried about things that I, for example, have not thought to make explicit as design features for an ecology of practice. One is there should be ones in which nature speaks to us, and then others should be one like artistic ones in which we are doing exactly like you said. We are t we're, we are making the voice of nature transposable into other domains, right? The problem yes. with the parkour, the problem, and I'm doing this for a reason, with the parkour and, and the horse, is it's, 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 it's very much in that situation, right? You can't right. transpose that to the boardroom. But if you're doing those things and then you have artists that figure out how to transpose the voice of nature to the boardroom, then you've got, to my mind, a much more viable ecology of practices. That's what I wanted to give. Agreed, to. and I'm, I'm with you 100%. I'm doing that with, you know, with yeah, artists. Yeah. I would just want to make the plug for the intellectual part again, though, because it's it's in the details it's in the it's in the layout of those concepts those that propositional knowledge holds within it insight into the continuity of everything and without that you, you've just got a body of knowledge whereas if you if you if you if, if you have enough knowledge about there's a reason we talk about trilobites there's a reason we talk about the cosmic microwave background radiation and the phospholipid bilayer which is all sort of science but the point is that that science makes it inescapable that everything is on a continuum if you do it if you do it thoroughly enough i agree um what i meant when i sort of put aside the intellectual i take it as a fundamental almost meta design principle that we have to be bridging between the scientific and the spiritual um and that's yes. properly the role of, but you take that that's hard work and you take that you know that's that is your work you you you, you find great joy in that work most don't or some don't i should say Right, but we need every ecology of practice to have some people who take joy in it, <laughs> what I, is what I'm proposing to you. Or else Absolutely. Or it'll, it'll bifurcate again, because there yes. is so much, there is so much magnetic pull to bifurcate these things and pull them apart again. That's right, and that's right, because we have this deeply Cartesian, Kantian grammar. Cultural inheritance. Yes, yeah. yes, very much. Well, I'll just keep chipping away at it, and uh, I'm telling you, once nature gets, once nature starts to speak, it's a, it's a, it is a, a, a reciprocal opening process. Yes, um, I and agree it, with and, that. and and I, the hardest though, the hardest reciprocal process to um, find an off ramp for, I think, is the, the current conversations around, uh, you know, religious experience because. They're, they're very good at policing their borders, it seems to me. Yes. And yes. I don't know how to make inroads, but I'm trying. I, I want to. I want to have conversations with, you know, with devout people in a way that, is, you know, that, that, we can, that we can come to a deeper understanding. Right. And so I, uh, I, I, me too, and I'm trying to engage in it, and I'm trying to make non-theism a recognized position distinct from pantheism, because whenever you try and talk about Spinoza, you usually get you usually get pigeonholed into pantheism, and then that is dismissed as being an inadequate account, and blah 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 blah. And instead of always running that argument, I have tried to make the case that we actually have a long history, a very well developed tradition that is running through, although typically not foregrounded, but running through the axial legacy religions of non theism, and that is what naturalistic non theism, right? Neoplatonic naturalistic non-theism is exactly what I am trying to uh, propose as a place in which we can have the courtyard of genuine yep. theologos.
Agreed. And, and, and we find ourselves, as John Rusin would say, at the beginning of that. Yes, yes, we are, yes. We are, we are children, uh, infants <laughs> in and, that and, process. And that's where uh, Schellingbeck's work on, you know, the fact that the most plausible hypothesis about us is that we're very spiritually immature, but not that we've finished our spiritual maturation and we have now the conclusive answers that we're choosing between. Uh, yeah, but, but 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 that but that assertion that we are actually spiritually mature is really t- a tough nut to crack. I think this is yeah, yeah. this is a, bi- a big frust- it's one frustration. It's perhaps it's not even the most important frustration, given you know given the ecological crisis. But it's one that I think clearly uh, 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 places places this kind of understanding out of reach for some for for many. Yeah, Schellenberg's work is I think I'm getting it right. I hope I am is really good. Um, his Religion After Science is one of those thin, beautiful books. Yeah, you keep uh, mentioning yeah. that to me. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's really good. We should yeah. wrap it up for today. I think yeah. this is a good, a good quote. I mean, we're, we, I, we will never be done talking. Uh, and that's a really good thing because I, I like being in relationship with you. But I, mm. as always, I want to give you, you know, a final sort of brief word uh, before uh, we, we, we shut things down. Um. I really, you know, I think, I think I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I just, I just hope we can keep up the conversation, make, we need more breakthroughs. I, I firmly believe that this thing that we're talking about, even though we may be, I may be clumsily groping around in here, somewhere in here is the future or there isn't one, you know, it's like, we just, we're on, a, we, we've gotten off the rails and, and uh, we need to be very careful, thoughtful, compassionate, generous with each other. And, and, and you are, by the way, you know, like, and I, and I think if we just keep doing this, you know, we, we're going to start to see cracks and, and, and the light will start to shine through. And we should just, we should just follow that where, where, where it leads us. Well, I, I think we did that today. I think, you know, for me, at least, right, the, the insights around some crucial design features for any ecology of practice. I think that's real gold that we mine today. And I want to thank you for that very much. Well, thank you, John. Appreciate it.